Well, good morning, Appalachian Church family. This is Pastor Brian. Just want to jump on here real quick and let you know that, as many of you already know, Pastor Butch and Miss Deborah have corona. And due to that, he was unable to record his weekly Bible study. His weekly Bible study will return just as soon as he has recovered uh, from this virus. But for this week, we're going to reach way back in our archives and pull one out. And uh, we hope that you'll enjoy that video this morning. Allow me to pray for you, and then we'll get to that video. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before the throne. We ask you, Lord, that you would help Pastor Butch and Miss Deborah to recover. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would put a hedge of protection around our church. Lord, we pray that you use this Bible study this morning. Uh, Lord, for your honor, for your glory. Lord, we'll give you praise, honor, and glory for it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Enjoy. Good morning. Welcome to the final Sunday in the month of March. And of course, uh, we're streaming live from the campus of Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina. And we want to welcome you to our time of Bible study this morning. Uh, we are honored and grateful that you've chosen us uh, this morning to study the Word of God together. And we want to uh, do our best this morning to honor the Lord, take our Bibles and uh, share some passages of Scripture together and talk about some things that are very important to our spiritual growth and maturity. I want to invite you to get you a cup of coffee and uh, get your Bible, your notebook, and your pen or pencil, and uh, let's get ready to study the Scriptures together today. Uh, before we get into the study, it's a couple of things that, that I want to share with you that are changing just a little bit about how we do our streaming ministry. As you'll notice, I'm in a different venue. Last Sunday, I was in the pulpit. Today, I'm in the uh, foyer, the, the vestibule, I guess is a good word for it, uh, in the front of our church. And uh, we're going to be moving things around a little bit as we get more established. But we want to try to create more of a teaching environment uh, so that we'll all feel more comfortable as we study together. Uh, one other thing I want to uh, make you aware of, as you look at your screen, you will see a box, and there is a chat, there is uh, notes, and there is an online Bible, and also a prayer box. I want you to understand that if you have a prayer need, you can fill out that prayer box, put a request there, and someone from our church will be viewing those and praying over those, and uh, we want you to, to know that you can contact us about your prayer needs. Also, in the chat box, one of the reasons that we're recording tonight instead of doing live as we did last Sunday, you're watching it live on Sunday morning, but this is pre-recorded so that I'll be able to be available to do the online chats. As we study the scriptures together on Sunday morning, I want you to uh, ask any questions or make any comments that you have regarding our lesson material as we move along. This will give you an opportunity to participate, and I will be there ready to answer your questions and address your comments, and that will allow you to feel more like we're in a, a small, small group study environment. So I hope you will do that. And of course, uh, you have an online Bible uh, option there. You can choose a translation that you're familiar with. I'm, of course, using the old King James. So I want you to, as just like we are, become more comfortable with uh, the process as we move through these days together. And I can tell you that uh, we've already been talking and we're moving on beyond this time of uh, social distancing and uh, safety at home, keeping the distance away. Uh, we will be doing streaming ministry beyond this once everything returns. Hopefully, sooner rather than later, returns to normal. Last week, in our study, we talked about the subject of faith. And we studied a little bit about why God uses faith as the standard that He requires of every person regarding salvation and personal relationship with Him. He chose faith because that's something every human being is capable of. Today, we're going to look at another term that we find in the Scriptures, and this one's a, it's a little more complicated. It's a little deeper uh, in its essence and application, but it's also very, very important, and it's connected very uh, 
intimately with the subject of faith. This is the word sanctification. Sanctification. Now we're going to talk about how it's used in the scriptures, and I want to invite you to find your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll be looking at a very short passage there. And as I did last week, I'm going to encourage you to read the entire chapter and read the other points of reference that I'll address this morning in our study so that you know, you'll be able to study beyond our time together. But sanctification basically means that God has set us apart from the rest of the world. Just as one would take an, an object from a table and move it from one location to another location, God has separated those who have placed their faith and trust in Him. Now, the Bible explains this as being two roads. Jesus used this terminology in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. He said there is a broad road. It's wide. And there are many who will be going in this path, this broad road path. But that broad road is, as Jesus said, the path to destruction. There is another path called the narrow road, and it's straight. And Jesus used the term narrow to describe it. And he said, few there would be that find it. Now, let's understand that God is not leaving it up to find our own way to heaven. What actually happens when we get saved is God takes that believing person and moves him or her from the broad road of destruction on to the narrow way, which leads to eternal life. And from that point in time, that moment of faith, that person begins the journey that the Bible describes as the sanctified life, is the set-apart life. So this morning, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to read verses 9 through 11 for our time this morning. The passage here describes the before and after of a child of God. Before a person is saved, that person may be a very good citizen, may be a moral person. That person may be, in their own minds and hearts, okay. But there are certain parts of our nature that begin to act out when all we have to go on is our natural instincts and our natural human reasoning. Let's look at it together. Beginning with 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, Paul writing says, Know ye not that the unrighteous, if you want to say the not righteous, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, these two verses tell us the kind of people that will not be in heaven. Now, that's not a popular truth in our time. For some reason, we have this mind that everybody will eventually get to heaven, that nobody is going to be cast aside by God in the end. But the truth is, very plainly stated here, there are certain types of people who will not go to heaven. Now, very carefully here. The reason they're not going to heaven is not because of what they do. They do what they do because they are lost, they are condemned, they are unsaved. We ask this question kind of humorously, why does a dog wag its tail? Why does a dog bark? Does a dog bark and wag its tail in order to become a dog, a canine? No. A dog barks and wags its tail because he's a dog. Human beings sin because they are sinners. They sin because they are separated from God. And that is the natural state all of us find ourselves in when we come into this world. Now, beyond the technicalities here, Paul makes it very simple for us. He wants us to see the before and the after picture. We have just read in verses 9 and 10 what happens 
to those people who do these things. And they do these things because of who they are, not what they do. Now look, if you will, at verse 11. And such were some of you. In other words, Paul is writing to folks who were doing the very things we just read about in verses 9 and 10. But he is saying you were doing these things before you were no longer doing those things now. Now watch. Such were some of you, but ye are washed. Ye are, here's the word, sanctified. Ye are justified. Now, not in your own works, not in your religion, not in your morality, but you are justified. Listen, here it is. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. It's very important that we all understand a very simple but vital truth. Salvation is totally of the Lord. We cannot save ourselves. It doesn't matter how good. It doesn't matter what we've accomplished. It doesn't matter how noble our intentions are. No human being can come to God on their own. They must come to a place where they are drawn by the Holy Spirit of God and saving faith provokes a spirit of repentance. Repentance is turning away from our former life. Not just not doing it anymore, but rejecting it. No longer wanting to do those things. Now watch. So let's look at this word sanctification for a few minutes this morning and see what it actually means. When we, when we look at this word sanctification, as we did the word faith last week, it's important that we understand what God is really saying to us. I want us to use a word that, that probably we're all very familiar with, and it's the word reserved. Instead of the word sanctified, which is a big word that you may or may not be able to wrap your mind around, the word sanctified means God has reserved us unto himself. God has reserved us unto himself. Now, if you go to a game, you go to a movie, you go to a play, uh, you go to a concert, in most cases, you're going to purchase a ticket, a reserved seat. By making the purchase, that purchase and that ticket entitles you to sit in a specific seat at that venue for the duration of that particular event. That seat is reserved for you. When God saves us, listen, he reserves us for himself. From that time on, we belong to Jesus. Now, that's a hard concept for us, especially in the West. We like to be our own person. We want to be independent, self-sufficient. But the truth of the matter is, there's not a human being in the history of the world with the exception of Jesus Christ, the God-man, that was ever truly independent. We are all dependent upon someone or something. When God saves us, he reserves us unto himself. Now, that's a vital truth for us to understand. When we use this term sanctification, we say, well, what right does God have to reserve us unto ourselves? Let's go back to the ticket analogy for a moment. When you purchase that ticket, it is the purchase of the ticket that gives you the right to sit in that seat at that venue. When Jesus saved you, he bought you with his own blood. Peter tells us we were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but we were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. A lot of people have this question. What if I get to heaven one day and God somehow for some reason rejects my salvation? Well, friend, if you came through the blood of Jesus Christ, that is absolutely impossible. The reason it's impossible is there is no higher price anywhere than the very life's blood of his only begotten son. There's not enough gold, there's not enough silver, there's not enough mineral wealth, there's not enough wealth in the universe 
that God would substitute and take in exchange of the blood of his only son. This is why the blood still matters to us. I take great assurance and complete expectation that I am going to heaven one day. I'm going to heaven not because that I prayed a prayer. I'm not going to heaven because I joined the church and was baptized. I'm not going to heaven because I'm an ordained minister. I'm going to heaven because Jesus saved me by his blood. Now listen, when you wrap your mind around this truth, you realize that you've been set apart, that you're different from the world. Now watch this. Jesus died to save every human being. The blood of Christ is sufficient for all humanity. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Okay? There's not a human being that's ever lived that was not covered by the blood of Jesus, but God requires that we openly, willfully receive it. God is almighty. We use the term omnipotent to describe his power. It's infinite. But God will not impose himself upon us. He has given to us free will, and only God knows why. I'll confess, if I was God, I wouldn't have given man free will. I wouldn't have done it. But God, being the loving, gracious, merciful God that he is, says, I will not impose my will on humanity. If man chooses to reject me, I will honor man's desires. Listen, there will be no one in heaven there because God forced them to be there. But, dear friend, remember this, that if you live in God's heaven, you will live there according to his standard of righteousness, his standard of holiness, and you will go there only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay? Nothing else works. So he's telling us here in verse 11 that these folks have been sanctified and what they used to be and what they used to do, they don't do anymore. He uses throughout this chapter two metaphors. One is the human body and the other is the temple. Of course, we know a temple is the house of worship. But the human body is a very interesting analogy and Paul uses it frequently in the New Testament the human body, every one of our bodies is unique to us. It has, it has characteristics, it has features that are not duplicated in any other person alive today. So the human body is unique. When God saves us, now listen carefully. When God saves you, dear friend, he saves you because of who you are, your uniqueness. And he's got a purpose for you. He's got a life for you. He's got... He's got a, a, a destiny, if you want to use that term for you, that will be unique to anyone else. God does not save in mass. God doesn't come down and save everybody in, in a massive crowd gathering. He saves us individually. And he uses this term of the human body to explain to us how every single one of us matters to God. In chapter 12 of this same first letter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18, for those of us who are sanctified, those of us who have been saved and God has set us apart, God has reserved us unto himself, he says he has placed us into the body where and how it pleases him. Now, we don't have time to get into this this morning, but it's very important that you understand. Once a person gets saved, Everything that happens in that person's life, regardless of what it is, everything that happens in that person's life has a purpose that God has ordained for that person. While we're all going to heaven, while we all are going to be followers of Jesus Christ, those of us who are saved, we are each on our own course, as Paul described it in 2 Timothy. We experience different things. We have different things that come up in our life, different experiences, different realities that happen in our lives that may be, be very unique to us. But all of those things happen because God has reserved that individual to himself and he's called that individual to a particular life. We 
use a Bible passage in Romans chapter 8 that says, in chapter 8 of Romans verse 28, we know that all things work together for good. Does this apply to everybody in the world? No. Watch carefully. For we know that all things work together for good to them who love God. As a follower of Jesus Christ, as someone Jesus has saved, purchased with his own blood, I have this wonderful reality in my life. It doesn't really matter what happens to me. It doesn't matter what happens around me in my life. I know it's going to be good. But what if it hurts? What if it brings fear? What if it brings disease or even death? Listen, for the child of God, all things ultimately work together for good. And this is because, listen, this is because he has reserved us unto himself. So let's keep moving here. Exactly what has God done for us? Number one, God is setting us apart from our old life. That's the first thing God has in mind when he saved me. Butch, I want to set you apart from the life you lived before. For every, listen, for every child of God, there is a before and there is an after. In the second letter that Paul wrote, writes to the Corinthians, he says this in chapter 5, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. There will always be the before and the after. A person, listen carefully, and this is not a statement to condemn, but it's a statement to clarify. Anyone who has truly been saved has truly been changed. A person cannot say that I got saved when I was five years old, six years old, and then live a life of sin, and then on their deathbed, everybody said, well, he made a childhood profession when he was so-and-so, and he's in heaven today. A person who is authentically saved, truly becomes God's child, is a person that will experience change. If there's been no change, there has been no conversion. Okay, now, so he's setting us apart from our old life. He does this three ways, and these are, uh, terms that we find in the Bible. One, he translates us. Now, we all understand what that word translate means. I speak English. You may, be, uh, you may have your first language in some other language. Uh, I've traveled to 14 nations, and everywhere I've been in these places, they have a native language. There's, there's people there that speak a different language than I. And we have to translate in order to communicate. I don't know German. I don't know... Uh, Scandinavian, I don't know French. So if I'm in these places, what I say has to be translated. Now watch. For the child of God, God translates us. We were, listen, we were condemned and we were on our way to eternal separation from God. After salvation, God translates us into the kingdom of his dear son. That means now the things that used to appeal to me now become sources of guilt, conviction, and shame. I may do them, but I will not enjoy them. Person still enjoying their sin, something's desperately wrong in their lives. When God saves us, he translates us. Secondly, he transfers us. I mentioned we were on one road, and now he's put us on another road. If you've ever been employed somewhere, and the, uh, the company you work for came in one day and said, listen, I know you're comfortable here, but we need you somewhere else, and you get transferred. When God saves a child of God, everything is transferred in their life. It's a new life. It's a new mission. It's a new purpose. The things that we once lived for before, we no longer live for those things anymore. And then thirdly, it's a transformed life. Uh, a few years ago, there were toys that came out. Movies were made about transformers. And these were some pretty incredible works of engineering. They would look like one thing, and you could work with them and change them into something else. I thought it was a beautiful picture of conversion when I saw uh, our children and even grandchildren now playing with them. God takes us into his hands as we are, just the way we are at that moment but then he transforms us in his hands into something else.
something wonderful, something with a purpose, something with eternal value, something we never could have been before. The things that God does in the life of his children cannot be replicated by human being. Now, all of us are capable of making New Year's resolutions. All of us are capable of what my grandma used to call spells of do better. That's not a term I've heard in many years now, but spell of do better basically was you woke up one day, hey, I'm going to do better. And you started out. It didn't last long generally. Kind of like the New Year's resolutions. When God changes a person, this transformation is both instant, but it's also incremental. The moment that I got saved, God saved me eternally. He sanctified me for his own use. That was an instant transaction. But through the journey of my life now, God has been continuing to reserve me for, my, for his daily use. And that looks very, very different. The second thing, not only, not only did God sanctify us to set us apart from our old lives, secondly, he set us apart so that he could reserve us for Jesus. Reserve us for Jesus. For Jesus and to be made in his likeness. Now watch this. The average American is a pretty selfish person, generally. We think about ourselves first. It's human. It's natural. Uh, we go to the closet and we choose what is comfortable, in most cases, to wear. Especially now, I, I just read this this week. It was kind of humorous. Walmart is selling out of tops, but the pants aren't selling. And I thought for a minute, well, why would anybody buy a top and not buy a the pants. And then I remembered if they're working at home, they're sitting in front of a computer screen, they can't see the pants. So they're not buying the nicer clothes and dressing up. They're being comfortable, you see. It's a very different concept for a person to realize that I belong to Jesus. Listen, and I exist for him. I don't exist for me anymore. I exist for Jesus. Now, some people say, well, you know, I've looked at Christians' lives and I'm not very impressed. Well, there's a lot more going on in the life of a true follower of Christ than you might think, dear friend. Uh, I'm a baseball fan. I love baseball. Of course, uh, we're all in mourning. If you're a baseball fan, you know that uh, this is the weekend for the kickoff, of the, or not the kickoff, the play ball thing with the, the baseball season. Here we are sitting uh, waiting on the word for this to pass and we get on with the baseball season. But for the average casual baseball viewer, they don't get it. Baseball's a far more complicated game than it looks like on TV. I've heard people say, I don't watch baseball because it's too slow. It's boring. You just don't know the game. Christianity, in many cases, is the very same way. We may look like maybe you know, not a lot's going on in our life, but God is active and present in our lives Every single day. And we are reserved for him. We actually are the father, God the father. We are his gift to his son. Yes. God is going to present us to his son as his bride one day. That's another lesson for another time. We are literally in existence today for his benefit. In fact, in this same chapter, he's going to tell you, what, do you not know that you're not your own, that you belong to Christ? You're bought with the price. So it's very important that this word reserve means we live for him. Third, when God saved us, he gave us a distinct purpose to, to exist. He wants us to do what we do in life with an eternal purpose in mind. So from the moment of my salvation, everything about my life changed. Everything began to change that day. And so we began to live a different life. Now, we're not always aware of all the changes that God's going to bring into our lives. For instance, when I got saved, I had no idea that one day that the Lord would call me into ministry to preach the gospel, to teach, to travel, 
to do personal witness, to write, to do things I've done in my life. I had no idea of any of that. But what I did know and what I learned very soon thereafter was that what had just happened to me was going to change my life forever. And it certainly has done that. Christians live by a different worldview. In America, of course, this is election year, and there's so much discussion, so much debate, and so much division and confusion and agitation. And sometimes people wonder, where are Christians even coming from? But when God saves us, we take upon what we have, what the Bible really refers to to us is, as his view of things. So we call it a biblical worldview. But we also live by a different set of values. The things that used to matter to me don't matter so much. Some of them still matter, such as family, but they take on a different value, an altogether different value than they had before. We also, we understand that now my life should be more focused on selflessness than self-centeredness. Do you see the difference? Today we live for others. You say, is that not a, a subservient life? Not really. You see, when we serve the Lord, we find our life, it takes on altogether new dynamics. I never know when God's going to give me an assignment on a given day. I have been out doing things that I had on the schedule to do, and the Lord completely rearranged that schedule. And instead, I found myself doing something for the kingdom of Christ. And so we live by a different uh, value. We live by a different uh, worldview. We live for others, not ourselves. We live humbly. You see, a true child of God comes to the reality there's not one thing about myself that I can claim as uh, self-confidence or self-sufficiency. I am what I am, as Paul said, by the grace of God. If there's anything good you can say about me, it's because of what God has done in our life. We also live compassionately. We're seeing it everywhere, every day. I'm, I'm so amazed when I look at the, uh, the images on television as I see the newscasts and uh, as I travel through social media. People are doing things to help other people out right now in the middle of this crisis. For the child of God, that's the default setting now. We live compassionately for others. We live for eternal things rather than temporal things. This is perhaps the biggest change of all of them is that now when I think about big decisions, when I think about big decisions, we all make them from time to time, but when I'm thinking about a big decision, the first question I ask is, God, what do you want? Not what I want, not what I think might be best for me, but Father, what do you want in my life? Is there something I should think about or consider that I'm not considered? When I think about dealing with other people, the Lord's brought so many wonderful people into my life. I have good friends. I have great family. And I have an extended uh, circle of people all over the world. These people matter to me. But the relationship is not about how can we consume our time and consume ourselves. It's about, it's about eternity. It's about what we can do for Christ and his kingdom that would truly matter. Now, when we think about the word sanctify, we're talking about the word reserve. But now there's something very important else. That's else uh, something else, I'm sorry, that's going on here. That is, God has reserved this for himself, but we must take a step and reserve God to ourselves. In the first letter of Peter's epistle, he says this, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to any man who asks you with the faith that is in you. Now watch. God has set me apart. God has reserved me. But it's very important that I also reserve God in my life. But what does that even mean? How does, how does one reserve God to himself or herself. Well, again, we Christians, we've got our own language, and sometimes we get caught up in our own language, and, and we forget that non-believers and folks who are not followers of Christ, they don't really understand. It's like we speak a different language. But when, when we say things in our language, 
about personal Savior. We say you need to ask Jesus to become your personal Savior. What are we saying? We're saying God has reserved us for himself. We must in turn reserve him for ourselves. Jesus Christ is my Savior. I have reserved him unto me. When it comes to my life, when it comes to my eternity, there is only one that matters. That person is Jesus. I've set him apart. Not only do I set him apart as my personal Savior, but I set him apart as my preeminent one. He's my personal Savior, but he's also my preeminent one. In fact, uh, one day, a few years ago, I was conversing with an atheist, and, and uh, I said, I just want to ask you a couple of questions and uh, see how you answer them. I said, uh, we all know that uh, if you want a nice, if you're a child and you want a nice gift for Christmas, who do you, who do you ask to give you a nice gift for Christmas? And he said, Santa. I said, yeah, sure, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I said, now, I know you're an atheist, but bear with me a minute. If you were to ask somebody in this world to save you, who would that be? This atheist said Jesus. This atheist said Jesus. I was blown away. Even people who are not by nature religious and certainly maybe even counter to the faith, they understand that when we talk about personal salvation, we talk about one person, Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. We make him our personal Savior. We make him our preeminent one in our life. He's the most important thing. You say, what about your wife? What about your children? What about your grandchildren? They all matter, but Jesus is number one. Jesus is preeminent. By the way, that doesn't cheat any of my other relationships out of anything because if I love Jesus right, if he's first in my life, I will be a better husband. I will be a better father. I will be a better human being if Jesus is in that place of preeminence. Sanctification may be a theological term that we use in the scriptures, but it's also a very practical term. And as we wind down this morning, I want us to talk about some applications for us. How do we actually go about living a sanctified life? I think it starts by acknowledging who Jesus is in our life. Friend, if you're here and you're listening this morning in your own home or wherever you may be, and you have never trusted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You've heard something today, maybe that you never thought about, that, that Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood so that he could purchase you, that you could become his. Maybe that's a different concept than you've ever heard. There's nothing God wants anymore. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 3, God is not willing that anyone die without him, but that all come to repentance. There'll never be a person in hell that God wanted there. In fact, for anyone to go to hell, it will be because they chose to reject his free gift of salvation through the blood of Jesus, his son. That's the truth. So we start living with the concept that if Jesus did so much for me, he loves me so much, I want to receive him. Secondly, I think it's important that we become intentional in our motives the Bible tells us God doesn't look at our actions so much. He doesn't concern, he's not concerned so much with our words. He says he looks at the heart. Am I living for Butch? Am I living so that other people will think, my, what a fine guy he is? Or are my motives focused upon pleasing Jesus? If I live, truly live to serve him, I'm living that reserved life, that sanctified life. Thirdly, by being reserved for him, it means that my life has certain uses that are exclusive. Watchman Nee once made a statement when asked to play a hand of cards with his fellow soldiers in China. They said, join us in this, this game of cards. He said, I cannot do that. My hands do not belong to me. 
They looked at him very strangely. What do you mean your hands do not belong to you? He said, my hands belong to Jesus. He paid for them with his own blood, and I can't use these hands to gamble. As we live for Jesus, it means that we live our lives differently. We reserve his right to us. Not only that, but we also, if we're set apart, we're reserved for God's use. We see the scriptures as our guide to pleasing the Lord. I think inside of every believer that I've ever talked to, a true believer wants to do this one thing. Listen, I want to please Jesus. But how can a mere human being with so many flaws possibly please a holy God? The scriptures give us the answers to live by faith, to love him first and supremely, and then to love our neighbors as ourselves. The scriptures give us all the direction we need. So in order for me to live that reserved life to God, I need to be a person that reveres and hallows and studies the Word of God. When I cherish the Scriptures and I live in them, I'm going to find myself on the path to pleasing Him. But I think also, if I want to be reserved for Him, I want to be the kind of ambassador, which we read about in 2 Corinthians, so that when other people see me, they don't see some downhearted, mopey, depressed person. They'll see someone who's joyful. In the midst of all of our trouble these days, there's a joy in my heart that, that I can't describe it in words. It's a joy that says it really doesn't matter what happens next. Jesus is my God, my Lord, my Savior, my friend. I live for him. Therefore, whatever happens will ultimately be okay. Jesus is now my source of peace. Not the president, not the government, not science, not medical field, not my own reasoning, not my own ingenuity. My source of joy, my source of peace is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. We're studying the Word of God together. and Just today we've seen how much God cares about us. Perhaps as you're listening, you may think, well, you know what? I've been a church member all my life, and, you know, I've done this and that, but I've really never understood just how much I matter to Jesus. Perhaps today will be a good day right where you are, just to bow your head. Nobody's there but you, maybe your family. And just ask God to save you, to apply his blood to your life. And from this time on in your life, you choose him. He's chosen you. He died for you. He's allowing you to hear this message this morning. So we study the scriptures together. Now it's your turn to maybe reach out to him and say, Lord, thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for purchasing my eternal destiny. Thank you for giving me the privilege to go to heaven when I die. But even more, the privilege to enjoy a purpose-driven, fulfilled, joyful life here and now. Father, I thank you that we have had this time together in the scriptures this morning. I pray that you will take your word and use it to the hearts of the people that are listening today. I pray that even now they'll bow their heads and simply call to you and ask you to save them. They don't have to be in church. They don't have to shake the preacher's hand. They do not have to fill out a card. All they need is to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and they will be saved. Help them to do that right now in Jesus' name. Now listen, before I leave you today, I want to say this. You can fill out that prayer card there online. Uh, you can chat in the chat box. You can email me. The email address is coming up on the screen. Butch at AppalachBaptistChurch.org. And it's no caps all the way through. And I'll be glad to take your email and correspond with you individually. Until this time next week when we will join you again, we hope you have a great week. Trust the Lord for everything. Keep your eyes set on him. You are loved. 
you're being prayed for, and thank you again for joining us.